Um, today is the 12th of February 2015. Um, my name is Rosa Krovska and I'm here with Lucy Shin. Um, this interview is for the Ming Lai London Institute British Chinese Workforce Heritage Project. Um, can I begin by asking your full name? Right, we haven't even started and the controversy uh, begins. Um, <clears throat> well, the name that I was given when I was in Hong Kong is Chow Lei Tung. Um, so, yes, that's, I guess that's my name. And, um, and where are you from? Hong Kong, Kowloon. In Kowloon, okay. And can you tell me a bit about your family? Um, no, in a word, because I don't know who they were. I was uh, one of a series, well, uh, a batch of uh, foundlings, orphans at the time. Um, during the late 50s, early 60s, it uh, was quite a, a horrendous time for Hong Kong. Um, and it was sort of made by the UN one of the... It, it became part of the, the, the year of the refugee um, by the UN because of the crisis in Hong Kong. So um, records weren't kept very, very well then. And... Uh, Having looked at what little kind of like archival material about me survived, uh, was the kind of fifties equivalent of cut and paste, which is somebody basically writing exactly the same thing about all the kind of like Hong Kong foundlings adoptees that, that came about there. Um, I was abandoned in Hong Kong, um, Kowloon, at on the steps of Number Nine Austin Avenue. And I've actually been back there. Um, it was, when I was abandoned, was a public stairwell. Um, it's now a nightclub, which is slightly disturbing. Um, I don't know why, um, but it was kind of like a think, as far as I understand from history, uh, one of the main uh, ingresses and egresses, uh, so there was uh, the end of, of a, a train route from mainland China, which makes sense. And I am one of 106... Um, Hong Kong adoptees or foundlings that comprised a programme called the Hong Kong Project and we were the first group of transracially adopted children to the UK um, organised that is I'm sure there were other transracial adoptions which were unofficial um, but we by and large all 106 of us think bar a couple of children were adopted by Western families in the UK. Um, quite a few of uh, Hong Kong adoptees that weren't part of the Hong Kong project um, did obviously go to other places like America, um, Australia, Canada. Um, one or two sort of other scan Norwegian uh, countries um, adopted. Uh, but obviously we as a group, the 106, we, we all came to the UK. Other than this being put out, I think, in a lot of Christian newspapers and newsletters, I think that's the, the common denominator. And given that in the 50s and 60s, the criteria for adopting... Uh, is very different from what it is today to be of good standing to be uh, from a uh, practicing Christian home um, and to own property uh, is very very different from what the, the hoops well the things that you have to satisfy these days for, for adoption let alone transracial adoption um, and so we came over and we were scattered to the four winds we went all over the place. Um, and because of the vocabulary of culture and hyphenated uh, you know, backgrounds, uh, um, understanding of identity um, was not in the British vocabulary. It, it was seen as, you know, that, that's the best way. You know, you, get, you just go with, a, with the family. To be crude about it, a family that could provide some money towards the flight for the child and, and had a home 
basically own their own home and that was it I mean for a year we were all wards of court so in theory and I know of one one case where the family who did adopt um, couldn't cope or decided they didn't want, want the child and she went into care here she didn't even get returned to Hong Kong um, in those days it was considered clean break you don't mention you don't mention the war as it were you don't say anything about the child's background um, from my point of view I mean I, I, I believe that most people who, who seek to adopt probably do it for the most uh, for the best of possible reasons the the actual practical way that it is done <clears throat> Then and still to a certain extent now, I think leaves a lot to be desired, and I think there is undue still influence on matters of childcare which cross racial and cultural boundaries, um, where religion, whether that be Christian or otherwise, um, can have, I think, a negative effect. Um, and I think it's still quite clear to me that um, institutions are very slow to accept that there is um, a trade-off when you transracially adopt a child. There is always going to be a trade-off. Now, that child, teenager, adult, may go through the rest of their life and they may not I think allow those challenges and disadvantages to affect them, but nevertheless they are still there. Um, so I think it is something that those institutions that make policy about adoption, specifically transracial adoption, uh, need to address. On the other hand of that which bear some root into obviously what I do as a living living in a society that still does not I believe fully recognise or is willing to engage the f with the fact that there are people like me who are British Chinese British East Asian then it is no surprise that their attitudes towards things like transracial adoption are what they are I think there has been a, a sea change in, in, in the actual situation themselves in some ways that you like mentioned about. Yeah. It's, it's similar in um, children who are adopted from, from care or taken in. They, they were sort of, as it were, white British family. Like mm. If you look at the Victorian times, there are people like Dr. Bernardo rounding up mm. children mm. from the streets, and that would have the same thing. You forget everything about the, the circumstance they were found in, and, mm. um, and um, it was considered, yeah, the clean break that you mentioned. But I think that's changed a lot from what I... I think it, ha it has. I mean, adoption is, as far as I'm concerned, the most extreme intervention you could ever possibly impose, and you are imposing upon a, the life of a child. Now, the reasons why one would do that usually are it is the only thing that you can do. Um, the state of being an orphan has, yes, I think it has changed. The state of being adopted and the view that society has on those that who are adopted, I don't think has changed. In the Western world, I don't think it's changed. Being adopted is, is, is yet another layer that's put on to people who invariably come from back ethnic, you know, ethnic minority backgrounds because it is usually only, and I hate to say it, and sometimes I do think this phrase is overly used wrongly, but white, privileged, middle class Westerners are the ones that can afford to transracially adopt. Um, and like I said, I... I I'm sure they think they're doing it for the best possible reasons. The fact that they can can do it, and to a certain extent, they are buying that child. Not so much now, I think, because 
Britain, of all the all the places of all the Western countries, has has tightened up on on what you can and cannot do in terms of adopting children. I mean, if you go back to the heady days of the nineties, you could literally go out, pick up a child from China, and come back, and it was a fait accompli. They would have to let you in with the child. That you cannot do, thankfully. Uh, but there are still other countries like the United States, Canada, and to a certain extent Australia, where you can do this, and and it is for profit. There are people that call themselves agencies who are profiting by this, um, and sometimes, especially in kind of like South South American countries and other sort. Of East Asian countries, whether the history and the provenance of that child is not dug into too deeply, um, and there are increasing cases of of, of of children who have been translationally adopted who's found out that they shouldn't have been because they had perfectly good families. Um, you know, not wanting to be overly controversial, but you know, so you take the halts organization in America which astounds me that it is still going. There is proof basically that a lot of those adoptions, a lot of those children they pick, picked up off the streets had families and they ended up in America, in American homes. Um, and you have a whole generation um, of kids that have grown up in this kind of like no man's land, neither one thing nor another. You know, for me, I grew up with all the privileges of being white, but never being able to take advantage of that because I'm never going to wake up and one day and be white, unless, of course, I decide to have extensive plastic surgery. Um, which, you know, strange as that might seem, and some people do kind of like do odd things. Um, I I can't, I don't benefit from that. If anything, I it's a disadvantage to me because I am literally neither one thing nor the other. Um, and when I, at the time that I grew up, you know, sort of making contact with. Um, certain uh, ethnic communities well, Chinese, Chinese Cantonese community was a nightmare I don't speak Cantonese they didn't trust me they saw me as an outsider not only an outsider but somebody that was pretending to be like them but then couldn't communicate you know, so I got it in the neck from both communities that I'm supposed to belong to and to a certain extent, I, there is still, I think, that. And that shows in the way that I think the wider British East Asian community um, still engages or doesn't engage with the wider society. Yet they will complain and bitterly bemoan the fact that they are not accepted or that there are incidents of, of racism you know, and, and my answer to that is that if you do not tell somebody you don't like something, how are they going to know that that behaviour on television or on the street or in a school is not to be accepted? To a certain extent, I think the larger British East Asian community has to say, take some culpability of the, the mess that we find ourselves in. You know, in terms of the lack of empathy, the lack of willingness to see people like me as being both British and Chinese or East Asian and having a right to be here. And I think, you know, sort of that those pigeons come home to roost, you know, and, and it's understandable, you know, as, an, as, a, as a migrant community. You, you do, your first priority is to make enough money to look after your your family, to see sh to make sure that they're okay, to make sure that you, those children don't have to go through the struggles that, that the first generation. We've gone beyond that. And, and we are still, you know, in, in some respects, 
some parts of, of the wider East Asian community or wanting to have their cake and eat it and you can't you know there we are we are now coming through to a generation um, especially of the Cantonese speaking uh, um, British Chinese who don't speak enough Cantonese to communicate with their parents or their grandparents they're much happier in the company of a mixed bunch of friends uh, ethnically socially you know um, and it's, you know, the community has to find a way of, 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 of mending those bridges before an entire generation is lost. Um, from my point of view, part of that is, you know, sort of the, commu- the wider community, East Asian community, has to start supporting, you know, its own community members, uh, artists whatever, not just the traditional professions that, yes, you know, if you want to go down the Confucian route, will give those parents the due diligence and respect and uh, retirement plan, if you like, for the future. Those days, I think, are gone, especially here in, in, in Britain. It's, it's very different now to the 50s and 60s when a lot of the, the Cantonese... Um, uh, migrants came over. You know, the world is a different place. Britain is very different. Um, and if 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 we are truly to make Great Britain truly diverse and inclusive, then it means that everybody has to participate. Everybody has to you know has to make their voice heard. And um, we have to get away from this insidious. Uh, view that we are the model minority and that we don't say anything Uh, up until recently that's true and it's been to our detriment we have been ill served by those that have managed to get into positions of power Um, whether that be artistically um, the few people that may have come through uh, politically and I don't mean MPs but you know business owners Restaurateurs who've been here since the 50s and 60s, they've made a very good living out of us. They need to start giving back to the wider community, which means they have to start engaging. They have to start supporting the arts. And when they realise the kudos and the level of uh, promotion that they can get, hence their business will thrive, then maybe they will start buying into that. Uh, But I think you know, sort of parts of the the wider East Asian community that count still have not understood that, you know, sort of engaging and supporting things like the arts um, on the mainstream British platform are not things to be shunned and are not things to be afraid of. They are actually things that can enhance people's lives and expectations and the way that we are viewed not only as a community but as British citizens which at the moment we, we, we are not and I mean there's, there's still I find it interesting that there's still this idea of a um, Chinese-ness because there's such diversity in the Chinese community in the UK mm. you've got the earlier Cantonese migrants and you've got the Vietnamese Chinese um, coming in the 70s, mm. and you've got the recent migrants, Mandarin speaking, and all these sort of things of what language you speak and all, all that and everything is... is yeah, I mean, I, unfortunately, I, unfortunately, and I think the industry to which I'm a professional has to take a huge, a huge responsibility for that. Um, you know... And obviously you'll you'll ask me about ping pong further on down the line, but in comparison to what uh, you know, one critic said to me that ping pong should have done for the British Chinese British East Asian community what my beautiful laundrette did for the South Asians, for the South British South Asians, and it didn't. And one one has to ask, and one 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 has to wonder why. 
why is it that the structural and institutionalized view of Chinese and, and East Asians is such that we merit, in some senses, such disdain, such ignorance, and such, you know, and we still do. People can still get away with broadcasting racist jokes about Chinese of performing yellow face and yellow voice. And we are told the people who are uh, serious about this and, and brave enough to kind of complain, we are told to shut up because it's not the same thing as, as blacking up. Well, excuse me, it is. And you're talking to somebody who's, who's East Asian and who's also British. And I find it just as offensive as, as my husband, who is his black British, would going to see a white actor putting on black makeup. It is just as horrendous. You know, the, the N word is, is now socially verboten. The C word for us is not. It's some kind of like, oh, term of endearment. And where I'm saying about culpability, you know, if, you, if, if, if the East Asian community doesn't stand up and say, look, I don't think that's acceptable, and it isn't acceptable, there are laws which, by using the C word, you contravene, yet somehow there seems to be an excuse for that. And there seems to be, uh, well, it's not the same thing. So we uh, really do, I think, have to get to the bottom of why this happens to us. And I think one of the ways that we can expose this is by embracing the artists that are both British and Chinese or East Asian, um, British East Asian, and supporting them. Because until our experience of living in this country, of being raised in this country, of seeing the world, Britain, from a different perspective is heard, I truly think nothing really will change. It's all very well hearing about all these wonderful diversity, we need more uh, BAME actors on screen and on stage. Yes, we do. Uh, we also need far more East Asians, just across the board. And we're not getting that because we're at a disadvantage, because we're not even recognised within the ethnic framework. We are a minority within a minority. And it has to do with numbers, for sure. But in some senses, why should numbers matter? Why should it be just because I've got more than you makes my my quest to be equally treated like everybody else any less than the next person's mm -hmm. um, so we have to we have to start stamping and shouting and it's not something I think to a certain extent that is is characteristically there in the East Asian makeup I don't think I think it is a cultural thing um, and I think because of the nature of, of how I grew up and the fact that I was kind of like basically pilloried from both sides of the fence, I don't see, I don't, I, I don't bonk at standing up and putting my head above the parapet. Do you think that um, with more kind of British East Asian um, actors or people in the arts industry who are coming from sort of mix of heritage like yourself in terms of they've sort of grown up here. Do you think that will give them more kind of it, on that? Yes and no. I mean it has to be it has to be it has to be backed up with writing, with 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 you know, producers and 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 people behind the camera as well as in front, uh, you know, that have an understanding you know, there is, don't get me wrong, there is, uh, writers can write whatever the hell they like, and they should. Um, it's just that 
you know, over the 30 odd years of me being a professional actor, I do find myself increasingly weary when I see yet another play that is telling, that has been written by a Caucasian actor that's telling me how I should feel as a British Chinese or a British East Asian. Now, that's their right to do that, but usually, and I have to say, usually, it's done really, really badly. The assumptions, a lot of the assumptions are still based upon those stereotypical caricature and, and racial tropes that, that were first kind of like put forward in the Victorian era. We haven't moved on from that, you know. People still ask me whether I do martial arts. Now, why should I do martial arts any more so than any other person? Other than the fact that I look like this, you know. I mean, and I uh, quite recently, and this is a, this is appalling. Quite recently, got asked, you know, when I told this person where I was born, how my Japanese was, and I just looked at this person and turned and walked away. It, those things are commonplace and I don't think many people within the wider society actually un- realise there's this going on you know also if in the institutions that you look for for your culture are predominantly headed by monoliths who are white middle-aged and Oxbridge trained male then the perception of people like me is hardly ever going to change you know Um, and you will continue to have prats like Jeremy Clarkson being excused and that for me is totally reprehensible and it is not a position that should be condoned or backed or supported I pay for the BBC through my licence why should I have to endure what they like to excuse as public school humour at my expense at my friend's expense I shouldn't have to because you know, if that was done of any other British ethnic minority, I do believe that that man would have been sacked. Yeah, and might be. But he's still here. Mm-hmm. You know, so there are a lot of inequalities that, that Britain has to kind of like face when it comes to uh, British East Asians. Um, and we have a long way to go. I think things are recently because of the, of people like Lenny Henry um, and Act for Change, and indeed the the group that I'm a founding member of, British East Asian Artists, have made a difference because we've called a lot of these people out and actually basically gone at them, hammer and tongue, and said it's not good enough. Time will tell as to whether all these new diversity, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, initiatives that the BBC, even the BBC, ITV, Channel Four, Sky have put in in terms of uh, commissioning, we will see if that truly has an effect. Being the sceptic that I am, I think it will have a limited effect because they will only take it so far, so it will be fine if you are up to the age of 30. If you're female and you're over the age of 30 and a person of colour, you can pretty much now forget it. Unless, of course, you're Dame Judi Dench. God love her. I think she's amazing, brilliant, no disrespect, but that's the way that it is. Well, we'll, um, it's been, I think it's been a really exciting year for, um, for all of, well, a few years for all of that stuff with, with, the, with mm-hmm. the British Social Artists working as a thing. Um, but um, we'll, we'll come back to the acting stuff and we'll go back a little bit. 
just to say, um, so what year was it when you were adopted? I came, flew into this country in 1963. And um, because you mentioned various experiences of, of different people, so, um, so I was going to ask about if you've met any other adoptees. Is that I have, yes. Batch? Yeah, I mean, I think I've met, out of the 106, I think I've met 88 of them. Um, I participated in a research study for... British Adoption and Fostering Agency, BAF, um, they decided they wanted to do a research project on the 106 adoptees. And I was one of the 66 that participated fully in that research project. Um, and I actually uh, presented um, twice to their conference, one when they... Uh, sort of launched the research results and one when they launched the book. So yes, I have met um, most of them. Yeah. A very curious experience um, in that for the first time I'd met so many people like me, all under one roof, all with different regional British accents, mm -hmm. which was like mad and great, but actually quite... I suppose disturbing in some senses in that I'm sure in the back of our minds, wherever we were, we we must, we sort of must have known that there are other people like other people like us. Uh, but pre-internet, pre-mobile phones, you know, how were you supposed to? You you wouldn't. Where would you start? You know, it just just and and also you know sort of. The, uh, in the days when I grew up, you know, children were children, and you didn't, you know, until you reached your majority, you did as you were told. You know, that's just the way that, that life was. So that was very odd, you know, and I think the research and, you know, sort of the ramifications of that um, had quite a deep impact, especially on the older adoptees, the ones that came over in the 50s. From some of the other adoptees, I've sort of come at life from a very different perspective. Um, and in some senses, I think, for me, well, for me personally, it was probably better for me in the fact that I've always known that well, I've always had the attitude from both sides that I don't belong, that I shouldn't be here. Um, and you cope with that. You just, you, well, some people don't, some people, you know, and I was lucky I managed to cope with it. And it's made me into the performer and the writer that I am. Uh, I think for some of the older adoptees, I think it raised a lot of questions about possibly their upbringing and, and how they may or may not have fitted in. Um, and it's opened a door which is quite, I think, quite raw. So they are quite a strange group of people in, in the sense that um, they're not very media friendly, um, which I can kind of like understand. So they don't, they don't uh, talk. They don't play very nicely with people who are from the media. And I'm kind of like sort of a bit of a person non grata in that sense is because I, I, I do what I do. And there are some within that group that are very suspicious of me. So, you know, it, it's... Uh, and there is a whole other area which I, I never knew existed um, in, in terms of adoption politics, which is fascinating and uh, kind of like quite um, scary in some senses. And then, um, because you mentioned it was the first transracial adoption programme internationally kind of organised one. Mm. So it started in the 50s? Yeah. Mm. Um, do you know what year it started? No, uh, early f uh, mid-50s I think. We went through until 1963. So you were one of the last... I was... Staff. 
one of the last. I mean, the adoptions continued after 1963, but the Hong Kong project, this specific project, I think terminated in 63. I think I was the penultimate flight um, of that project. Adoptions from Hong Kong continued until I think around about 1973 and then stopped because the Hong Kong uh, government changed its laws and also I think uh, socially and, and, and financially there were more people within Hong Kong who had the ability to, to actually take care of or uh, want to adopt uh, children from local orphanages. And you mentioned the, um, the 50s and 60s in Hong Kong mm. being a difficult time and that being the, the after effects of the famine in, in mainland China. Well, I mean, you're talking not only post-war, uh, yes, you're talking people uh, fleeing um, communist China for whatever reason. So you have all these people migrating um, and Hong Kong was kind of like quite... It's quite a small landmass anyway, um, and an influx of people that just had nowhere to go. Um, pretty much the same as is in Central Europe uh, post-war, if you like. So uh, that is one of the reasons why that project was set up, because there was they were literally running out of space to house the the amount of of, of kids kids and babies that were being abandoned. Because that they just couldn't, you know, cope. They suffered two very, very um, devastating uh, outbreaks. I think one was of influenza, one was of typhoid as well. So you had all this going on as well. So um, Hong Kong, unless you were uh, an expat, um, was a pretty grim place to be, basically during that period. I think. And um, you mentioned thinking of the archives there, and I don't know, have any of you, or, I mean, any of the, the group managed to trace anyone? No, you wouldn't be able to. I mean, the records, record, the records that did exist locally, I do believe, were burned uh, in the late 80s. Um, the orphanage that I grew up in, uh, I think, was demolished in the early 80s as well. Um, Polyon Cook is the only, and St Christopher's are the only other two surviving orphanages uh, which had anything to do with that programme. Um, if you were truly a foundling, which I was, and I think I would say about 90% of the, the babies on that programme, or the babies that went into those uh, orphanages were, Unless some kind of like note or whatever was left with the baby or the child, there is no way whatsoever of of, of finding your natural family. Uh, a because it's illegal to do that, uh, abandon a child, which I do believe it's illegal to do that here. But I think the way the authorities handled it over in Hong Kong was was very different, um, which is hence why. I suppose no identifying marks were were left with the children. That's my assumption. Um, the records that were kept, if my international social services file is to uh, anything to go by, would have been pretty much standard, equivalent of copy and paste. We're well, no, just changing a few details. Um, Apart from obviously factual stuff like the state of the child, I mean, I was uh, in very, very poor health, um, chronically malnutrition, covered in boils, um, and they had to make a, a more than a, a guess as to how old I was when they found me. Um, I was probably preterm anyway, so. The age that I am is, may not indeed be the age that I am, but I have nothing to go by on that. So, uh, yeah. So I, I don't think, unless you, I suppose these days with 
DNA testing, you could maybe get an indication of where you came from. I mean, I, I now do not assume anything. I My parents could have been refugees from mainland China. I could be, for want of a better word, I could be a bastard. I, for all I know, I could be Eurasian. I don't think I am. Um, but who knows? Those were the times that, that were, were happening in, in, in Hong Kong. So it's very difficult to, I would imagine, to find any concrete proof of who your actual uh, genetic family and parents were. And so how do you, um, what day do you have for your birthday? Um, my birthday is the day that I was found, which is on the 6th. Okay. I, oh no, actually, no, that's not true. I was found on the 3rd, and I think I went into the orphanage on the 6th, and that's my birthday. And is that what they did for all the I think kids? so, yeah, yeah. Um, I no, not as much. As I, it's difficult because now, in order to do that sort of thing, in order to teach or whatever or to train, you'd have to be a qualified social worker. Uh, in, in the same way that you know, when I first started out, I used to do the odd bit of teaching at, at uh, FEs and HEs. I'm not a qualified teacher, but. Um, I was able to do that because of um, my professional experience and my experience gained through that gave me the... Now that's very difficult. I know you can still do it, but many institutions won't even entertain that. You have to have a teaching qualification, which I think is mental, to be perfectly honest, especially when it comes to the arts. Um, and now where every single drama school is a degree course... You need people like me who've actually got vocational experience um, and you know a good deal of professional experience behind them to actually give the students the other side of things. It's very difficult, you know. I'd love to be able to do that, um, and I've worked quite recently with quite a few final year and recent graduates from some of the. the top drama schools in London and I just think wow you spent three grand a term and for what well, no disrespect to the to the guys that I've you know sort of been in contact with and but there there is a general lack of vocational acumen you know so it, it's kind of difficult I've spoken to I do speak to uh, a range of NHS specialist organisations who deal in childcare and adoption um, and, the, and I've only been doing that since 2013 um, and it is interesting you know one of the first times I did this I was approached by one of the delegates who, who said oh I've been working in this field for over 30 years and this is the first time I've ever ever come across someone like you and I'm thinking so you work in adoption and you've never ever actually spoken to a transracial adoptee that's kind of wrong I think that, that, that sums it up I do now help to train prospective transracial adoptee parents um, on occasions um, by actually coming in and talking to them and uh, I do think they sometimes look at me and think um, but you know you need to hear certain things from the horse's mouth and I think in this country uh, until we give ourselves full licence to talk about race and identity which we still don't then uh, it's imperative that people like me, lay people like me that have life experience, um, should be given a platform to speak. 
to these people who are making policy about adoptions and making decisions about children um, that are not from the host culture or host ethnicity and how are they making those decisions if they have no understanding of the complexities that go along with those decisions and the ramifications of those decisions so yeah and do you find that work um, well, from the perspective of adopting parents do you find that sort of I don't know fulfilling or do you, do you find it is interesting for you or I think it's it's frightening for them not in a but I think it is quite scary for them because I don't I don't pull my punches in the nicest possible way. Um, I think if I can get through to just one couple that and get them to understand that we the way that we, we the vocabulary we that we use when we apply it towards children is in, inherently selfish. Uh, you know, uh, uh, as one fellow transnational adoptee that I interviewed uh, said, you know, we con ourselves that we have children because it's an altruistic act. It's not. We are very, very selfish creatures. We want us to somehow go on forever, and the way of doing that is having children. You know, and we kid, you know, we're kidding ourselves if we if if we're bringing children into the world because it's a wonderful place because actually it isn't. You know, the language that we apply to children that is my child, this child belongs. No, actually, no, it doesn't belong to you. We have, uh, you know, the great privilege for those of us who do have children of bringing a child into this world and helping that child to grow into the best possible human being it can be that's our responsibility we don't own that child we will never own that child and I think you know the language of, of that you mix that with transracial adoption it's, it can be very dangerous Adoption, transracial adoption, is for the benefit of the child, not the parents. And I think somewhere along the line it's become skew-waved. Transracial adoption is for the parents. You go out and you choose the perfect child. Well, why would the child that you choose be any more perfect than a naturally born child? The onus that, that transracial adoption puts onto the adoptee is often so huge the expectations that you are the perfect this you are the perfect that and if you're not then somehow you're being ungrateful you have to be eternally grateful for being adopted because somebody saved you somebody's given you a better life well you don't put that pressure on a naturally born child you don't you don't say that out. that may be the expectation in the back of your head but that isn't put down on paper. It isn't said out loud. You know. You don't... I mean, I think there is an onus, and it comes from... There's a certain amount, I think, of vicariousness that comes with adoption, particularly transracial adoption, because you usually have a mixture of affluent West somehow saving somebody from the third world in inverted commas and somehow that gives that relationship an imbalance um, which continues throughout you know your life you know I, I've been called all sorts of things under the sun for writing articles that are not overly favourable towards transracial adoption um, how dare I I'm ungrateful you know how could I just think I truly admit if I hadn't been adopted I probably wouldn't be here I certainly wouldn't have the career that I've had or ha I'm having but to, to be 
you know, beholden forever. That's, that's not something that is expected of a naturally born child. What is this inequality? And there is, an, and I have to say, there is a mixture of all sorts of things going on. Not least of all is race. And especially when it comes to being East Asian and the way that the West, and particularly Britain, views China and its love-hate relationship it's always had with the Far East. It's very one-sided, it's very negative, and the negativeness always falls on us, unfortunately, you know, with an intransigence from the other party to see that possibly the way the language that they're using is inflammatory or, or basically out and out racist and, and, and prejudiced. And like I've said before, they wouldn't dream of applying the same petty or stereotypical social and cultural profiles if they were talking to somebody who was British South Asian or, or black British. They wouldn't dream of doing it. But somehow we are kind of like it's open season. It doesn't really matter. We don't, as a community, matter. And, and as I've said, you know, partly uh, the wider community, East Asian community, has to take responsibility for that, for never, for having acquiesced and allowed people to basically use them as doormats by not saying, actually, I don't like it when you call me this, or I'm not prepared to actually put up with this behaviour. The nth degree of that is, you know, sort of you get a Malgai situation where somebody's beaten to death. You know. And we have to learn from things like that. What made that particular circumstance, those particular people in, in that situation, what made the police force think that it was okay to ignore that? There is an inherent disjunct, there is an inherent inequality there. Much as, the, you know, th there was back in the 70s for a black person in the UK. That things have moved on, you know. Although, you know, friends of mine who come from that community would say that they are regressing again. So we can't ever be you know, sort of complacent about that, yeah. I think. And, and I, I, for one, will fight tooth and nail to, to make sure that, that, is, that we get a better equality for people who are like, uh, you know, who are British East Asian. And so, with that, um, did you, when you first became an actor, because you were the first ethnically Chinese Right, correction. I was the first first British Chinese female to train at an adult recognised drama school and graduate. I mean, I think there have been others who'd, who'd gone to uh, a, a drama yeah, school for, for kids and, and come through that. Um, but as far as I'm aware, I was the first British Chinese uh, to be accepted onto a recognised drama school. Uh, in those days, there were only five. Yeah, five drama schools, one university, uh, one kind of like in between a, a university and a college. So there were a finite number of places where you could go and train to become a professional actor. And why did you choose acting? Why did you choose acting? Um, I mean, originally I, I wanted to pursue music. Um, and I, I realised quite early on that um, the best that I could probably hope for would be the first flute in an orchestra. I wasn't good enough to become a soloist. I, I, I didn't have what it took to be a soloist. Um, and being the first flute in an orchestra really wasn't my bag. I didn't really want to do that. So um, I, instead of going on to sixth form college like a normal person, 
I uh, went to do, I think, the only pre-vocational course in the whole of South East England, um, and I studied uh, art, fine art, and stage design, film studies, the first place that gave drama O-level, um, English and music. Um, and in the second year, I guess because a lot of people were um, auditioning for drama schools, I thought, I'll give it a go. And I did, and I uh, got in. Um, I didn't choose Rose Bruford. I loved being there. It, it, well, it's kind of like it had its pros and its cons, and, and I'm very glad that I did go to Rose Bruford. Um, it, those were in the days when it was a grant system, and uh, the local authority for anything that wasn't humanities was discretionary. So people who wanted to do soft subjects like art or you know sort of drama, um, it was a discretionary grant. And the only place that they would give me a grant for was Rose Bruford. So I went to Rose Bruford, and that's how I ended up there. Um, being cynical about it, uh, I was possibly the token ethnic for that year. There was a black actress in the year above me, Diane Louise Jordan. And uh, in the year below me, there was a disabled actor. Um, that's being probably slightly ingenuous, but I do now, in hindsight, look back at it and think, mm, yes, I wonder what was going on there. I mean, having said that, I got in, uh, you know, sort of uh, huge odds against you ever getting into a drama school, and that was the only, wasn't the only drama school that I got into, but that was the one that I went to. Um, yeah. And uh, yes, I survived and I um, graduated uh, with an honours degree. So, at, which was the, uh, obviously at that time it was the only drama school around that you could actually get a physical qualification from, and that's how they managed to circumvent certain things, I suppose. Um, I mean, I think if you ask most of the people who were in my year, well, above or below, and in my year. Um, I think there were very few I might be shot down in flames who, who specifically on the theatre arts course wanted to go there as a drama school I think it was much more to do financially than anything else it was a, it was a good school I mean I learned a hell of a lot and I'm glad that I did actually go there as opposed to any of the others that I got on to because I think it gave me a much more rounded uh, education and basis from which to, to become a professional actor. And so you, um, you've been in acting for the, the whole of your working life? Right? Yep. And have you ever had any other jobs? Oh God, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, factory work, assembly line work, putting a nut on a bolt crisp factory, chicken factory, it was fun, um, when I was out cleaning chemical loos, uh, market research, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, those were the days when, you, A, you got paid under the counter, cash in hand, uh, B, yes, you, you would find stuff to do, um, seasonal stuff, um, cleaning barges and boats and stuff, and Polo Factory, Sweet Factory. Um, it, those types of jobs now, you can't... They're not available. It just it doesn't exist. You can't, you can't do that. So it's, uh, you know, it's really tough for, for, gra for graduates these days. You know. you know, because there's less industry in the UK to... Well, there is less alternative stuff for them to do. There is no cash-in-hand work. Well, people won't admit to it. It's it's very difficult. I mean, life is very different now. Um, there are also so many drama schools around now. Um, it's unbelievable. Um, the entertainment industry has always been overcrowded, underpaid, and undermanned. And people, you know, like ninety, I think it's eighty percent of all actors are. Uh, at any one given time are out of work. So it is 
oversubscribed immensely um, and very difficult. So I, I don't know, if you're a drama student now, I don't know how you cope. I really don't. But do you think it's gotten, it's gotten harder? It's always been hard. I think the graduates that, that succeed now are the ones that get off their backside and do stuff for themselves. And I have to say, in, in terms of what was available for me to be able to do that, when I graduated back in the 80s, it's, it's not comparable. You know, you can go and, and make a film. You don't need to invest in high-end equipment now. It, it is affordable. If you know what you're doing or if you're willing to learn and to get off your backside and do it for yourself, you have YouTube, Vimeo, all of these platforms now. Um, and the ones that succeed are the ones that do, do the stuff for themselves. Whereas when I came out, it was still very... I mean, the union was a closed shop. In order to work, you had to have a union card. In order to get a union card, you had to work. So uh, I have to say, I am, I am, you know, sort of old labour, as it were. I think that is the worst thing that could have happened to the industry in terms of, of, of making uh, uh, it so easy for people to get an equity card. There is now no quality. There is no assurance of any type of quality to an already subjective industry. I think it's really difficult. And there are so many avenues for people to train. Good, bad or indifferent. There is no quality on that either. There is no overall standard. When I went to, the, went to train... There were, as I said, five drama schools, major drama schools. Those were the ones that the agents, the casting directors knew and went to. And they knew that people who passed through those portals would come out the other side of a particular standard. Similarly, if you went to Warwick University, which was the only university that did drama course, they knew that there was a level at which you would have been trained. Now, there are some that are better than others, but it's, you know, it's... And, and people are having to pay a huge amount for the privilege. Well, I mean, um, yeah, it's become a money thing, isn't it? Um, so when you graduate, I mean, these are the jobs that were kind of bits and pieces, mm. and none of them was a major kind of profession for you so it's always been acting Mm. so can you tell us a bit about like your early experiences as an actor and um, in did you start in theatre or well my first job was the film ping pong so that was unusual in that you you know you you don't in those days you didn't really do that you went repertory theatre was still widely available when I, I graduated. Um, so that was your, literally your first My first job, job, yeah. Out of drama school? Mm. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. It is, but nobody knows that, and nobody really... This is. It sounds like I'm kind of like... Uh, sounds like I'm kind of being incredibly big-headed. And the only reason I've recently started pumping this is uh, a friend of mine said, you know, sort of, you have to be aware of the history. Um, I got involved in uh, part of a project called the British Asian Minority and Ethnic Shakespeare to document productions of Shakespeare that had been acted and populated by non-white, well, BAME actors. And it's, it, you know... We were doing it back in the 80s and the 90s, so why can't we do it now? There were far more mixed, multicultural, whatever you like to call it, far more productions of, uh, of Shakespeare that were done by, by, by mixed casts when I graduated from drama school than there are being done now. You know. So... <sighs> 
to a certain extent, and I'm not. I say this now so that people realise that it, you know we have to, as a group, start taking pride in the the achievements that we have we have made. And the only reason I say this is so that people can start looking at things in context. And putting it into context, if I was from any other ethnic minority, this would be well known, well documented, etc., etc. I just happen to be from a minority that is considered by the wider society and the wider community as silent, acquiescent and, and, and a model minority and we don't actually really need to cater for them because they do their own thing. Um, you know, that's a lead role in a feature film, a British feature film that went to, to the Venice Film Festival that got a standing ovation at the Sala Grande, which is the, one of the biggest cinemas in Venice, and basically nada over here. That kind of like says it all to me, even without the hindsight, you know. And as, of, as, as, as the critic friend, critic sort of said to me, you know, this should have done all that my beautiful laundrette did for the South British South Asians, for the British East Asians, and he didn't. And that's a shame. That film has kind of like sort of had a, a revival, and you know, sort of. And I keep saying to people who, who say, "Oh, why can't we see?" It? I said, "Well, write to Channel Four, write to Picture Palace, and say you want to buy it, because they make a, they would make a small fortune out of it." Yeah, because there is no, there there are no other works that deal that deal with that community in that way. Yes, there was Sour Sweet and Peggy Sue, but two very very different offerings. You know, and uh, it's a shame. I mean, well, you know, I think because um, it is really hard to get hold of until the BFI has now got it on there. Thing. Mm. So I was able to watch mm. it, and it's um, it's an amazing film, um, and I think it really well. I mean, I guess I guess um, maybe if you just tell us a bit about like, how how you came to be involved being a very young drama school. I I was sent sent up for an audition, as was the norm. Um, I think I did a reading, and then they called me back for a screen test. And then I got the call to say that I got the role. I mean, I think Pochi was basically looking for somebody who was natural. And I think part of that was probably somebody who was less experienced and therefore had not developed ticks and tricks and, and all the wonderful things that you do, bad habits, I suppose, in, in, in some senses. But on the other hand, you know, as I I was told this after I'd finished the film um, by the producer that they'd given me two weeks, and if it hadn't worked out, they would have cast somebody else because I, I I'd never done done anything else. Um, I was very lucky in that Pochi, I think, is an, an amazing director. He managed to get performances out of people that up until then had made a living doing the usual kind of like East Asian roles that, you know, were 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 of the time and were expected. Uh, unfortunately, they're still going on now, but, you know, sort of the, at least then there was an excuse for that sort of want of uh, representation. So, yes, you know, and uh, I was incredibly lucky. Uh, and it, it, it is luck, you know. I was in the right place at the right time, and I'd just come out of drama school at the right time, and and that's how I got into it. Yeah. And I mean, because of your own background and and your own sort of British Chinese heritage, which is, um, and you you've talked about the experience being stuck between the two sides, and it's interesting because the, this character um, Elaine in the film mm. is stuck between these two sides in, in, in terms of how people um, relate to her and they say, oh, you're not really... I mean, she's come over as a, as a small child, but some of the people like her, her uncle in the um, takeaways, yeah, you're yeah. not really... Chinese, yeah. And then the, 
mainland offices like colonial land and mm-hmm. all this stuff. So she's sort of, um, but then she's also not accepted as 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 a lawyer in her own right, right by right. her colleagues. She's the little Chinese mm. sort of thing. Mm. So with your own background, like how how did it feel to or how did that affect your your working practice as a, as, a, as an actor in that film or how how was that experience? I mean, it, it was. Uh, frightening in some senses but it was exhilarating because and I suppose to a certain extent I was slightly spoilt being you know sort of a newbie um, and I was thinking oh yeah I'm going to get roles that are like this uh-uh. that doesn't happen um, so I suppose it raised expectations and also a, a level of awareness um that I think maybe other actors and actresses of a similar background didn't have, and therefore, if you don't have it, you're not uns- unsatisfied. Do you know what I mean? Um, and the agent that I had then at the time, I think, turned down more stuff than I, I was seen for because it was all what I would call me no speaking English takeaway kind of like roles. Um, and yeah I mean but then on the other hand you know I was doing theatre so and I was until kind of like around about the 1990s mid 1990s I was a jobbing actor theatres were still there etc and then it kind of it all sort of went horribly wrong I'm not sure why uh, work starts to dry up I ended up working more time in the market research, which was the fin-in. That fin-in became the full-time and for a period of eight years. I didn't... I got one TV gig. No theatre whatsoever. Um, I'm not quite sure why that change happened. I don't know. But it did. Um, And it wasn't until 2010 when I was literally, literally on the verge of saying, this is it, I've had enough, I'm just going to jack it all in. I was cast in the lead uh, of a new play by Tim Luscombe called Hungry Ghosts at the Orange Tree, uh, which kind of like kicked off my career again, which was amazing. Um, Because I was literally on the, the, literally, the day before, I think Tim called my agent and and asked me to, to come and audition. I was, I was just thinking that this is it, I have to find a nine to five job that I can stomach, that I can uh, basically handle, and, and that'll be it. Just walk away from it. Mm. And so, Hungry Ghosts, like, that is, um, is it about, what's it about? It's a play which is set in China uh, under the, the, the shadow of the Formula uh, F1 Grand Prix. Mm-hmm about a brother and a sister uh, two very very different lives um, the brother has become fairly high up in the political li- hierarchy the sister is a, a rebel basically um, it, it's the clash of, of that you know the choices that we make it, the choices that we make it just happens to be set in a country where the choices that you make uh, have a much more profound uh, impact on your life and how you live your life, what you can and cannot do. Uh, so yeah, and uh, again, both uh, um, Benedict Wong was playing my brother, which is great, and uh, we were both uh, um, nominated for Offie Awards, which was brilliant, so yeah. So, so yeah, to, to um, with going from Hong Kong and this in the in the eighties, this mm-hmm. interest, and then I feel like there's been this revival. I mean, I don't know if you think Hungry Ghost is, is is part of that, but there's seems to be much more kind of um, with all the the campaigning that everyone did after the Orphan of Jack. Yeah. I don't know if there's there has been. 
in more interest, I think. I mean, the summer, summer autumn of 2013 was unprecedented, basically. And yes, to a certain extent, Hungry Ghosts, I think, kicked this off to a certain extent. And it's a shame that um, the play, as, as lovely as The Orange Tree was, it's a shame that it, the Hungry Ghost wasn't actually staged at the Hampstead, which was originally where it was supposed to have been staged yeah. at. But it's then... Well, it, it's it's not that. It's, it's just that I think it would have had a different reception. And it's also in a London. And, and as, as fabulous as the orange tree is, it's uh, to get to, you know, a, logistically, critics don't like going there because it is kind of like quite a way out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those things. So then, you know, so 2013, you have the arrest of Ai Weiwei, Chimerica, Yellow Face, Fu Manchu Complex, Golden Child, and, no, sorry, uh, Golden Child and the World of Extreme Happiness. Brilliant. But only one of those plays was written by British East Asian. Which Only is one. Fu Manchu Complex. Yeah. And all the others are... Uh, Ai Weiwei was... Um, What's his name? English guy. Uh, World of Extreme Happiness, obviously, is American, Asian American, which is kind of like a very, uh, you know, their experience or the relationship to China is very different to, I think, a Brit, British Chinese, British East Asian. Uh, Yellow Face and Golden Child, David Henry Huang, brilliant writer. Um, and uh, that's it, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and even kind of like, you know, sort of uh, uh, Hungry Ghost was written by Tim Luscombe, who's a white guy. You know, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I thought, to a certain extent, that play was... It's like nothing I've ever read before. And it's one of those things, as an actor, you read something and you think, I, I really have to be in this. And I was very lucky enough that, that he, he, he thought that I was right for the, for the character. Um, you know, it, it, I personally didn't like Chimerica. I thought it was far too simplistic. Um, I know it wowed everybody, mainly kind of like white middle class theatre going folk. That is not a bad thing because it went to the, the West End and it put. British East Asian actors on a mainstream stage. Unfortunately, uh, some of them were still doing accents, which I didn't think was necessary, but that's a preference. Art is, you know, subjective. Um, and I will support anything that shows people, that gives British East Asians opportunities, substantive opportunities. You know, I, I'm sick and tired of, of this argument. Oh, there are not enough of... You, it was said back in the 70s and the 80s, there aren't enough bl good black actors, which is a total load of crap. And we, we are now going through this. There aren't enough good British East Asian actors. Yes, there are. The fact that you choose to only offer opportunities to less than a handful is not our fault when it comes to kind of like TV and film. You know... But there are more than just a couple of people, you know. There are some amazing actors who've been around, like me, for quite some considerable time, and others who have not been around for quite some considerable time. You know, we don't get a chance to look in on these opportunities because it isn't a level playing field, because we are restricted and hampered by views and perceptions that, for want of a better word, white producers, white directors and white casting directors bring to this content. You know. And every time a British East Asian gets a major part in something, I cheer. But really, I'd like to be in a position and cheer at something, uh, a characterization, because it isn't British Chinese, because it's just a character, and they happen to be Chinese. I mean, like Chippo, 
doing, you know, in fortitude. It doesn't matter. She's a brilliant actress, you know, in a in a in a great production. And it's gone under the un, under the radar, and she's just doing it, and that's brilliant. I think that's brilliant, you know. And Game of Thrones, I mean, next season will be, uh, I think, Jess Wu's in that, and that's brilliant. We need more things like this. We need the BBC, Channel Four, and ITV to be doing what HBO and Sky are doing, and 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 other uh, American companies are doing. Not, not watching talent going over to the states. You know, if one could put it in in crass terms, you know, this government or this country paid for me to go to, through to drama school. It pays for a lot of people, in 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 essence, to go through drama school, even though it's it's now a loan system. But it it, it pays for it. They do not invest in that investment. They do not nurture that investment. You know, when we have productions that are, are essentially financially uh, backed by British companies here, and they're going abroad to cast for East Asian roles, that, that wouldn't happen in America. It wouldn't happen in Canada. It wouldn't happen in Australia. So why should why do we not fight? Because the, I think it comes down again to the way that we are viewed as people in this society. We're set apart. We're not part of the British cultural landscape yet, and we need to be. You know, and until we have our own footprint in that cultural landscape, these things will continue to happen, and it has to stop. It, it makes no sense to me whatsoever, considering how much investment and how much. Profit they can make if they have diverse casts. It, it's been proved that diversity sells, sells really, really well. You know. And I think the South, the South Asian um, British in film and everything like this, and there's been theatres like Tower Arts mm-hmm. really pushed through different actors and everything. I mean, because you compared um, Ping Pong with My Beautiful Laundrette, I mean, why do you think? That was the case. It didn't. It was feature film, really well received. Um, why didn't it have the same effect? Do you think? Oh, I don't. I, your guess is as good as mine. I don't think the will was there. I don't know why. I mean, I'm just guessing. Um, the will of the people that were marketing the film or the audience? I mean, I think there was also, I think there was, uh, in my view at that time, a, not a problem, making, making art is the easy thing, that we can all, we can all do the creative thing, it's the, the back office administration, it's the, the boring PR, it's the pushing, it's the, you know, getting people to sort of buy the product that I don't think then Channel 4 making the, you know, Film on 4 uh, films was very good at. I don't think it was, it was, they, I think, concentrated more on the art, making the films, and then it was, you know, a scrabble to kind of like get the films out there. I also think there is an attitude that you know sort of you do something with an east asian character and you've somehow got to market it to the east asians well that's a total load of bs you don't people get hung up about this no are we not people do we not bleed like everybody else of course we do you know you just have to make engaging stories that everybody you know wants to go and see and chimerica i way way World of Extreme Happiness, Fu Manchu, you know, that exposes the lie that in theatre, uh, you know, theatre going audiences, your standard theatre going audience isn't interested in, in, in plays with, with East Asian themes or East Asian characters. It's not untrue. It is. And it will go and see them. But you, you have to market it as a play, not as a thing that is just solely for East Asians. You know, it, it, it makes no sense to me whatsoever 
you know, I think people get hung up on this thing that it's East Asian art, so we'll do this and it's for this box and it's only for these people. I think you, you know, we, we have suffered th theatrically, East Asians, from that particular thinking, you know, when you have one singular, a single company that purports to represent an entire community. So you ring fence that, the Arts Council is just as culpable, we all give them funding, that box ticked. You are making, you know, a cultural apartheid. You are giving people an out. We don't need to include people from that section because they've already got their ring fence, their culture going on in that company. So we don't need, even need to think about that. I think we need to get away from that. We need to be inclusive. We don't need to be separatist. We don't need to be ethnically specific because Britain isn't ethnically specific anymore. And I mean, do you think there's been a film, a British film made since Ping Pong that's, that's had a, a similar... I no. Mean, if there had, then people wouldn't want to go and see Ping Pong. Because I mean, I was astounded at the, at the, the response um, that the ping pong screening last year at the Southeast Asian um, Arts Festival had. And it, this film continues to kind of like astound me and, and surprise me. Uh, and it's not just, and it isn't just people from, uh, you know, East Asian backgrounds who... who just think the film's great. I think it is flawed, but then, you know, after 30 or nearly 30 years, there are bits of it which are slightly dated, but, you know, it, it was made when it was made, you know. And when, you, when you're involved in a film like that, and because it was the first thing that I'd ever done, I look at it in a very different way, because... I'm standing there watching some scenes thinking, oh, how did we manage to get six people in that room and not, you know, so it's kind of like slightly different the way that I, you know, but it, it, it continues to surprise me how many people just love the film. And I think that to a certain extent says it all. No, there hasn't been a film that has dealt with the East Asian community in that way, or even delved into the history, the shared history of East Asians in, in, in Britain. Um, will a film ever be made? No, but I don't think it will. Things would have to change so much more. I mean, even if I could get past the gatekeepers into an organisation like the BBC or, or ITV or even Sky, and try and pitch one of the, the many ideas that uh, myself and, um, and friends have had about, for one, doing, uh, for want of a better word, uh, the equivalent of an upstairs, downstairs, but involving uh, an East Asian family. Because that's the way we would have to pitch it. And immediately, you're on a loser. Because if you try, and uh, we've tried, if you try and pitch it, uh, another way you only get so far and then it's oh well you know this is not really for us which is a euphemism for basically we don't want an ethnically specific drama well it's not an ethnically specific drama because if you could see past that then maybe a, a lot more people would actually enjoy it because it wouldn't just be East Asians because the East End of London wasn't just populated by East Enders uh, East Asians it was populated by a lot of other you know sort of people I don't know. I mean, I think things would have to radically change so that, you know, um, it was more acceptable. And, and still, it is not acceptable. I mean, to put it in co context, a friend, a, a dear friend of mine who's a, a, um, an amazing actor who, who pointed this out to me uh, quite a few years ago, he said, if a white actress had had the equivalent career that I've had and worked with the people that I've worked with, they would have had at least one TV series in which they'd, you know, starred in 
at least done at least two other feature films and probably got the possibility of doing stage work which would have led to Olivier nominations or BAFTA nominations. I wanted to ask you about your, your current project, actually, because um, we we've not we've not we're kind of getting not much time. But you're making a documentary mm. which is about your own, and you're writing a lot now mm. and to provide that mm. those roles and that voice in the industry. So, um, what are you working yeah. on? Um, I'm my independent documentary, abandoned, adopted here. Um, is in the final stages of post-production. Um, uh, that is uh, a look at what what it's like to to grow up as a transracial adoptee. Uh, it looks at things like identity, belonging, and what does it actually mean to be British Chinese, British East Asian? Is there such a thing? Um, that's in a word, and hopefully that will. Uh, being sent off to film festivals and stuff, so fingers crossed. Um, I am working on two writing commissions, which I've won. One for Nimblefish, uh, which will be a solo theatre piece. Um, and that is looking at, again, transracial adoption and mental health, because mental health within the East Asian community community and also the wider community is still something which is not uh, understood or, or taken very well uh, there are misconceptions uh, and I have also been commissioned by um, a famous um, central London theatre, I can't say who because it's not public let to do a, a small um, theatre piece along with five other East Asian writers uh, which will be really exciting. Um, a play of mine called Conversations with My Unknown Mother, which is about the adoption triad of adoptee, birth mother, adoptive mother. Hopefully, uh, we'll go into a full production next year. Fingers crossed. Subject to funding and finding funding, the usual thing. Um, I'm also in the throes of finishing my first collection of poetry for an anthology. So I'm looking for a publisher. Um, yeah, it's just, we will see whether the opportunities present themselves, whether people will start being willing to read what I have to write. Um, when I first started doing this, Seriously, after my first one woman show, um, I sent out a couple of pieces, uh, very complimentary, but it was it's not, we don't really know where this work sits, which is a euphemism for we have no idea how to market this and we're scared of putting it on. You know, and I think also that the East Asian community has, has, has got to, to, in some senses, I probably get shot down in flames and grow a pair in that we have to start talking about the things that matter to us the things that make us who we are both British and East Asian so if that means talking about gambling if that means talking about triads if that means talking about illegal immigration then that's what we have to do black the black community and the South Asian community have no problem talking about yardies, talking about honour killings. It's part of who they are. You don't have to like it, you don't have to agree with it, but it, it's part of their community. It is something that infuses. It is, is part of their culture. So we have to start, you know, everybody knows about the Moon Festival. Everybody knows about Chinese New Year. You know, come on, let's let's move away from the Disney you know let's talk about the real let's talk about interracial marriages let's talk about the the differences between the generations 
the, the, you know, the aspirations, the failings. Let's talk about the things that make us who we are and how we fit into this society or why we feel we don't fit into this society. I am, if I see another play which is about Chinese takeaways, I will scream. You know, if it's, you know, yeah. there's nothing wrong in setting a play in a Chinese takeaway or a restaurant, but I don't, I don't want it to be about number 35 and number 36. I want, I want it to be about the people who have to work in that environment or how they came to be there, or why they're stuck there, or why they feel they're stuck there, or whatever, or about, you know, sort of the foot and mouth outbreak, and, and them shutting up shop for the first time. I want it to be about those things, not about we're a Chinese, Chinese or East Asian family and this is what we do. If I want to see that, I'll go on to, you know, sort of National Geographic, I can see documentaries about that. I don't, you know, I want to see us being represented as real people who have an interaction with everybody else in this, on this planet, in this country. Well, it sounds... I want to put the Asian back into Caucasian. That's what I want to do. And I want to be considered as Asian, and I'm sick and tired of people telling me I'm not Asian and that I have to be satisfied with calling myself East Asian. You know, I, was, I have been told in the past... Uh, this is when I went up for a casting. Oh, you can't possibly, you're, you're not Asian. I was, well, I was born on the continent of Asia. No, 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 no. no. We, we were looking for, I said, oh, you mean the subcontinent of India? I'm talking about a continent of Asia, you know, that rather large land mass that has what, nearly 8.7% of the world's population. We kind of like cover quite a lot of area. I want to be able to put, yes, Asian back into Caucasian here, now, in the 20th century. I want people to understand our shared histories and why people like me are here. You know, and stop the people to go back home. Well, sorry, I am home, love. If you hadn't knack in Hong Kong, then I wouldn't be here. It's to be crude about it. And I think there's a lack of understanding in history a distinct lack of understanding in history that, that does not help, which is why things like, you know, sort of ensuring the Chinese Labour Corps are remembered are so important. All and these projects, they are vital that, so that people can have an understanding that this isn't some kind of like random migration that people go, oh yeah, I'll go. It's not. It is connected. We are connected, you know. Whether people like that or not is a is is another thing. Yeah, it's true. It's true as well. I mean, yeah, it's so missing from school curriculum and everything like this. But uh, I mean, that sounds like there's with all these groups, there's a lot of change, and it's good. And then in yeah, I mean, one can only hope that things will will progress. Mm-hmm. Um, to a certain extent, there are certain things which were out of our control, mm-hmm. out of any kind of like you know sort of uh, mm-hmm. movement that advocates for a particular you know sort of f- for change. Uh, at the end of the day, it will be down to places like the BBC, ITV, and Channel Four, and the producers and, and casting directors to mm-hmm. pull their finger out, I suppose, for want of a better word. We, we we shall see, you know. Wow, I mean that's it's um thanks for thanks for talking with us today. I mean, is there anything that we haven't um kind of covered? I mean, I have I've got loads more questions for you, to be honest. But um but we're we're kind of we'll have to sort of draw to a close. But is there anything that is there anything else that you wanted to? No, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think to a certain extent my my plea would be that as a community we have to start being far more vocal. I mean, I think that happened and, and yes, being slightly kind of like banging our own drum, British East Asians started that off when we basically turned around and took the RSC on. 
I mean, we were told, we were told that we were mad for doing that. And yeah, we, right. we were told, that we, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, Daniel, who kind of like was the spearhead of that, um, I felt that more keenly. And it is a, a frightening thing because there was one point when I thought, that's it, I'll never work in theatre again, ever. Time will tell whether that's true or not. Um, but it's just, you know, sort of, I think it was the straw that broke the camel's back. How can you publicise something as the Chinese Hamlet and only have three actors in there? And I will say, and there's been a lot of nonsense about this, that we, all of us, the 11 founding members, couldn't have been happier that three British East Asian actors managed to get into the RSC, which is a phenomenal achievement. It, sh it would have been even better if they'd given those three actual, real, meaningful roles. You know, and, and that, as I've said on, on, on many interviews uh, before, if the RSC, even if the RSC had only cast the Orphan of Jow as an East Asian, None of what have happened, I think, would have happened. It would have been, oh, yeah, mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, and I went to see the production. I, you know, I had to go and see the production. I have made so much fuss about it. And I just sat there. It is a subjective thing. But I sat there and I thought, wow, Greg Dorian's been on, on out in the public media saying I got a grant from the Arts Council to go and do two weeks research in China for this. And I'm looking at stuff that comes from Japan, part Korean costumes, Japanese swords, taiko drums, and this is supposed to be set in the 13th century feudal China. Now, nobody else, I don't think, in the audience would have noticed the thing, but that's not the point. You know, so don't give me this nonsense, you know, that you're doing us a, a huge favour. You set yourself up as doing something in one particular way. The reverse of that is if, if I decided to put on a Western play that was set in the Second World War and I had people wearing First World War uniforms, I would be hung, drawn and quartered and laughed off the planet. Yet they, people think it's perfectly acceptable to do it the other way around. That is cultural appropriation without any understanding as, as set dressing, literally as set dressing. You know, fine, if you want to say you're setting something in the East, then do it that way. It, it's, it's a bugbear of mine that I have of, of anything, of any type of spe specific costume or style or culture or heritage, you have to know what that means. It's not enough just to put on the clothes. You have to know what it means in the same way that, you know, sort of at drama school, you are taught the history, well, I was taught potted history of costume. And you ha in doing that, you understand why people do the things they do and why certain plays were written in certain ways and a certain language. Because how you dress and what you dress makes you act and respond in, in, in a particular physical way because you are restricted or you can't respond in any other way. So, you know, sort of, you have to do that across the whole entire sort of globe if you're going to use ethnically specific costume. And if you don't understand what that means, then either get somebody who can tell you what it means or don't do it. Or say it's in the style of and then you get, you know, covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Sorry, rant over. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's, it's fantastic that, um, that all of you took them on, and the, the RSC will, I mean, they, the, it's appalling, really, what they did in the 21st century. So. But they're still so. here. They're still there. But, however, a couple of uh, British East Asians in the coming up, up and coming season so that's that's a good thing which is brilliant um there should be more and you know hopefully that will spread who knows i don't know it's kind of like small steps but 
yet again, you know, small steps, and it's 30 years on from when these conversations were first being had. So I do tend to be rather cynical about, uh, you know, how, how, how much longer do we have to keep saying small steps and, you know, sort of how many more conversations do we have to have in public where, you know, somebody uh, as important, uh, well, as well known as Lenny Henry has to get up and get angry before anybody takes any notice, you know, uh, who knows. Well, it's, it's, um, it's, it sounds like a really interesting kind of period for you now to get, get into it, to mm. start to do more things. And so I hope it will, like, lots of luck with the next project. Thank you. We hope, uh, we hope, <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing the, the documentary. Mm. It sounds, yeah. it sounds really good. So am I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm assisting, uh, but um, uh, Ronit Miranda, who's my editor, an yeah. amazing person that she is, can't speak highly enough of Ronit. Um, she's doing all the editing, um, uh, but you know, sort of, I've, I've basically sort of given her the editor's yes. notes, so she's doing that to my um, my direction. So we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. So hopefully uh, the final um, cut will be coming out soon for my perusal. We're just grading and uh, doing the post-production sound mix. So we'll see what happens.